fact, the original Doom in VR is a more fun virtual reality experience than Doom VFR, a game specifically designed around virtual reality. Sadly though, due to its insane speed and quick turns, Doom in VR is nearly unplayable for a good portion of VR owners. With virtual reality's stiff price point and lack of software support, VR has been declared by some to be nothing more than a fad, and if you look at the current library of VR games, it may be hard to argue otherwise. Just like the motion control gimmick of the late 2000s, many VR games are fun at first, but as soon as the novelty wears off, there's a lot to be desired. However, despite me saying this, I would like to say that VR is, in my opinion, one of the most ambitious things to come out of the gaming industry in the past decade, with the potential to seriously change how we experience video games. Right now, VR's biggest hurdle isn't its steep price point or even its current lack of software. Its biggest issue is a biological one, and that is motion sickness. You see, in the early days of the modern VR fad, back before Oculus was bought and owned by Facebook, and even before motion controls were a staple of VR hardware, the main focus of virtual reality for developers wasn't to design games exclusively for VR, it was to play old and upcoming games with optional VR support. Similar to how Ultra HD TVs are an optional enhancement to traditional gaming, the early days of virtual reality was seen as an immersive enhancement to games you would have likely bought and played anyways. Why did VR's potential library go from tweaked versions of traditional games to majorly VR-exclusive games? Two words, motion sickness. I've been lucky, both in that I know a friend who trusts me enough to let me borrow his $1,000 Index VR device, and lucky enough that I'm within the group of people who experience little to no motion sickness while playing VR games. After spending a few dozen hours in virtual reality, I understand why some people would say VR is nothing more than a gimmicky fad. While the first few hours of walking around in virtual reality is amazing, you'll likely get bored quickly playing the myriad of hastily created games made for the platform. VR works because it's the ultimate immersion tool, but ultimate immersion does little if the game you're playing isn't good. However, play a game that is already good in VR, say the original Half-Life, Morrowind, Doom, Metroid Prime, or Quake as my personal favorite examples, and you'll find yourself in an experience completely unmatched by anything else the gaming industry has been able to accomplish this decade. And before you think VR only works in first-person games, you'd be wrong. As others have shown, playing third-person Nintendo games through Dolphin VR is similarly as breathtaking. Modern VR development has amazing potential, but it's restricted by a severe limitation. That limitation is designing a game around the possibility of motion sickness. The reason so few traditional games have VR support is because moving around in virtual reality traditionally, as in pushing W on a keyboard or forward on a thumbstick, causes severe motion sickness in those susceptible. This would make sense when you remember what causes motion sickness. Motion sickness comes from a conflict between the senses. When your eyes are telling you you're moving while your inner ear says you're stationary, your body reacts by believing itself to be sick. This is because oftentimes the false sensation of movement, be it visually or otherwise, is a common symptom of many illnesses. In a response to our body thinking it's sick, it does the logical thing and says, hey, if I feel like I'm moving but my inner ear is telling me I'm not, I must be sick. Therefore, I should throw up to get rid of whatever negative germ or substance is inside of me. This is also why people often get car sick or seasick as well. So, in fear of making their players sick, most developers have decided not to include VR support for their games, thus shrinking VR's potential library to mostly VR-exclusive games, which majorly don't include traditional movement, which then limits the type of games developers can make in VR. On top of that, with VR cells being so small compared to traditional gaming hardware, this also means that in order to make a profit, most VR games are made low budget. With most VR games being low budget, there isn't much incentive for consumers to buy VR headsets. Basically, it's a vicious cycle and ensures that VR will continue to be a niche consumer product. But the thing is, it doesn't have to be this way. Adding virtual reality support for non-VR games is far cheaper and easier to do than making a big budget game from scratch. In fact, the games I listed as good VR examples weren't even officially VR supported. Instead, VR support was modded in by fans in their spare time, showing how comparatively easy it is to do. So it seems motion sickness is the biggest hurdle to VR taking off. What have developers done to address this issue? Well, you've likely seen the use of teleportation being used in a lot of VR games. 
teleportation works because instantly changing locations doesn't seem to trigger the motion sensing parts of our brains. The issue is, is that traditional games don't really support nor were designed around teleportation, and teleportation is quite immersion killing as well. Another innovation that's being developed is VR treadmills. Being able to physically walk, even if you're standing still, seems to really help with motion sickness issues. The major issue with this, at least for the short term, is their price, with current VR treadmills costing more than the VR devices themselves. The sort of get around that uses the same concept and has been tried in multiple games is grip walking. Instead of moving using a stick, some games allow you to virtually move by imitating a jogging motion. Like VR treadmills, this has been shown to significantly reduce VR sickness. A few other innovations that seem to have quite a bit of promise are real-time FOV adjustments and virtual noses. Changing the player's field of view when they move or turn their head increases the effect of feeling as if you're looking through, a, say, a car window as opposed to physically moving yourself. As for the fake VR nose, it gives players a stationary point in their field of view. Both have been shown through study to reduce, even if not completely eliminate, motion sickness in test subjects trying VR. While I think all of these avenues of research can help reduce VR motion sickness, what I think may be the best sign for the future of the technology is that over time, usually within just a few weeks, people seem to be able to get used to VR. Many people remember getting severe car sickness as a kid. Over time, their body got used to it, and as they grew older, it became harder for them to get motion sick. The body's natural ability to adapt to such unnatural movement situations has been demonstrated in both humans and animals alike, and is likely what allows us to be able to drive vehicles in the first place. Such adaptation is being seen in people who play VR. A few years ago, VR games that involved traditional player movement were rare. But over time, VR games that support traditional movement like Gorn, Blade and Sorcery, the Bethesda ports, and the highly anticipated Boneworks have gained more and more popularity. This is likely due to people naturally getting used to VR. It was well known that up until recently, Valve, a company that had a lot of sway in VR, held the philosophy that one should never move the player. With the announcement of Half-Life Alex increasing people's interest in VR again, how they design their game will likely greatly affect future trends of the medium. Half-Life Alex supporting traditional movement may be a huge win as far as helping to eliminate the perceived design limitations of virtual reality. Sure, VR will likely still be quite expensive for some time to come, but just like with 4K TVs, the price will go down eventually. If VR gaming can reach the same production quality as non-VR games, and if better yet, developers no longer fear giving VR support to future games, we can likely start to see virtual reality finally starting to lose its fad status and start to reach its potential as a transformative experience that allows us to play games in a new and completely immersive way. If and until that day comes, I guess I can be content playing some of my old favorites again in VR. See ya.